uh, good morning, good evening, good night, wherever you may be. You are, of course, watching uh, <laughs> the uh, the show called Sketching Past Midnight Live. I have no idea what time it is. Oh, yeah, it is past midnight, 13 minutes past where I live at anyway. And because we're broadcasting live over the World Wide Web, it's untelling <laughs> what time it is where you're at. But it doesn't matter because we're here together. We're hanging out. We're going to have a good time. For those that will be watching live and those that will be watching the replay, I am, of course, C.B. Smallwood, the greatest of all time, the undisputed, unchallenged, so it must be true. And if you bear with me for for one second, one second, and let me, you know, get situated. I was trying to find my sweet tea, and it ran off on me. It grew legs, and it disappeared. <clears throat> Oh, and uh, I didn't know where it was at, so I had to go. I had to go grab me a, a bottle of water out of the fridge, which I'll probably need that, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> so how is everybody doing today? Hope hope you're all doing well. Hope you're having a wonderful Friday-ish, Saturday-ish uh, night, <laughs> evening, day, afternoon, wherever you're at. So, uh, as we warm up and everything, I, I got a couple of topics that I, I figured that I would talk about. Uh, now, uh, for those watching the replay, just want to remind you that we have a question of the day. And the question of the day is this. What are some of uh, your, what, what are some special comics from your childhood? You know, is, is there any comic books that you can think of growing up that, uh, that really touched your heart, pulled your strings for one reason or another. Uh, have any of them held up to the test of time, you know? Have they stood the test of scrutiny uh, from the wisdom of old age? I don't know, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter. But what are some of those uh, comics? So I'll, I'll, let, I'll give you all whatever my answer or answers may be a little bit later on in the show. Uh, and of course you can let me know in the comments down below and I will read what you got as well as everybody else. They, uh, always read your all's comments. So let's get rid of that question of the day. Let's see. Um, also, uh, I know you're looking at old stuff, but I promise you, I promise you, I've got more new art to show you. We will be sketching here later on tonight. Uh, lots of cool stuff, but I like to kind of like ease us into it. So trying a few new things, some interesting things. Uh, uh, for example, I got some um, news headlines to share with you. I have no idea what these are, but I just think that they're interesting and a good way to um, start things off. Uh, sleeping microbes wake up after 100 million years buried under the sea floor. Okay. So, uh, and, and listen, I don't want you to think that, uh, that I'm just going to do a bunch of talking cause I've got art to show and I also got a uh, new art that you haven't seen, uh, all kinds of different stuff. So let me go ahead and read this article to get things started. Sleeping microbes wake up after 100 million years buried under the sea floor. And this is an article written by Raffi Let, Let, let let sir <laughs> as of july 30th 2020 no one knew that single celled organisms could live so long microbes found themselves buried in the dirt 100 and uh 101.5 million years ago back before even tyrannosaurus rex was earth's biggest meat eating dinosaur uh, called Spinosaurus roamed the earth. Time passed, continents shifted, oceans rose and fell, great apes emerged, and eventually human beings evolved with the curiosity and skills to dig up these ancient cells. And now, and now I'm, I'm reading this article, and this right here has nothing to do with that. <laughs> and um, where would I leave off at? And now, in a Japanese lab, researchers have brought the single-celled organisms back to life. Oh, yes. This is always a good start of a good sci-fi horror movie. I love it. I love it. If only they could just get on the ball and, and bring us back a mammoth. Start, start bringing back extinct animals. I'm all for it. Let's do it. 
Uh, researchers aboard the drill ship uh, Jodies, J O I D E S, Jodies, Jodies, I'm going to say Jodies, Jodies Resolution, uh, collected sediment samples from the bottom of the ocean 10 years ago. The samples came from 328 feet, 100 meters below the 20,000 uh, foot deep, 6,000 whatever M's bottom of the South Pacific uh, Gyre, Geary, <laughs> whatever. That's a region of the Pacific Ocean with very few, um, with very few nutrients, little oxygen available for life to survive on. And researchers were looking for data on how microbes get along in such a remote part of the world. Now, does this sound interesting so far? Uh, before I read any further, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the mighty and incredible Abe Sapien, who says, "Hey there, I'm glad to have you here with us tonight." and any other voyeurs that we have, and anyone that will take the time to watch the replay. Um, just kind of getting the show started, getting everything warmed up, sharing some interesting little do-bits. I know you're getting tired of looking at this, but I promise I will show more art and, and other stuff, and we will be sketching here in a little bit. <clears throat> so, anyway, uh, basically these Japanese scientists went to a deep part of the ocean, dug up some dirt, has microbes in it, and the microbes were dead or alive, not for sure. According to the headline of the article, they revived them, okay? So here's a quote. Our main question was whether life could exist in such a nutrient-limited environment, or if this was a lifeless zone. Uh, Yuki Morono, a scientist at the Japanese Agency for Marine Earth Science and Technology and lead author of a new paper on the microbes, said in a statement, and we wanted to know how long the microbes could sustain their life in a near absence of food. Their results indicate that even cells found in a 101.5 million year old sediment samples are capable of waking up when oxygen and nutrients become available. Uh, so I'm not going to read the rest of this. That's pretty much a stick of it. <laughs> you know, they basically put oxygen and nutrients and, and expose these microbes to it, and the, the microbes just woke up. So they were dormant for millions and millions, over a hundred million years, give or take. You know, and when people talk about Mars, and let me get my ink ready here, when people talk about Mars and, and uh, some of these other uh, planets and stuff, and the possibilities of life there, and the uh, you know microbes and bacteria and stuff, it's possible. You know, a lot of people say that nothing can live on uh, Mars because of radiation. But you'd be survive, su surprised, you know. I, I think I think like it's what um, uh, what was that guy in Jurassic Park? You remember the 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 skeptic in the Jurassic Park? That, that actor that that actor that's very endearing. He's always enjoyable to watch and everything he plays. Uh, he also played in the remake of The Fly. You know, he did good, he knocked that out of the park. Well, anyway, <clears throat> that guy. Uh, he was a skeptic and, and his thing was, you know, life will find a way, life will find a way. You know, there's even like these little micro, um, cellular, cell, cellular uh, organisms that, um, can survive in space. <laughs> so you never know. You never know. I forgot what they call it, but they, but they kind of look like little adorable mutant hippos. <laughs> All right, so moving on from interesting uh, science facts, let's go talk about comics. So what are we looking at here? We're looking at the uh, the first page of the Crimson Frog uh, project that I'm working on. Uh, for anyone wondering, I've not given up on Wildcat or the Wildcat anthology or the horror anthology that I'm working on. I'm just pumping out stuff as I'm going along. And I think once I get these three pages in, I'm going to shift my focus onto one of the other uh, projects, uh, probably the anthology, you know. All right, okay, so here is uh, page two. If I can get it, stay, stay, page. Will you stay? I'll put my paper over here. Okay, so uh, last time you've seen, I had uh, ink, inked it only so far down, but here's what it looks like now. I've got the uh, borders and stuff going on. Uh, 
Yeah, getting all quiet here. Yeah. I think it turned out pretty good. I'm 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 very happy with it, you know. I'm not like super thrilled, but I am uh I like it. I like it. I think I think I accomplished my mission. And then when you put these two pages together, it starts to look like a comic book if I can get it. Don't make me cuss paper, I will. If I can get and get you know, get them together here. It looks very comic bookish, I think. Comic booky. Makes me feel like I know what I'm doing. So let's move this stuff out of the way and let's get over here to the third page, which I had uh, drafted, roughed out, whatever. And then you stay on there. You got to hold this paper up. Okay. So. Basically, here's what we got going on. Uh, this is supposed to be like a gun uh, that I kind of just, you know, put that in there. It's from a uh, worm's eye view. I, I thought it would look kind of be a dramatic shot. Um, and this is a bunch of uh, chaos that's going on. Yeah. I'm not sure about this panel, though. Um, it looks a little confusing. You know, uh, this is actually another panel. These are four panels here. This one, whatever. And, and then we got this uh, bottom one. And this is uh, three panels. Got this deal going on. And uh, he's telling him to go. And then here we got the uh, the dead bug, and we've got a silhouette of the ruins of the of the city, and then we got um, crimson frog, you know, walking away. <clears throat> okay, let me uh, sip my um, freaking uh, tea here. Yeah, answer some comments. Com com not comics. Answer some com com. Come, <laughs> I'm developing a stutter. Comments, Com comments. I don't know. It's not the things that shoot through the sky. I'm, it's the things that that you write. <laughs> so Abe writes, uh, very cool ink, CB. I really appreciate it. Uh, let me get my handy dandy brush out. <clears throat> Uh, give rights you need to scan that first page okay i'll i'll get on that i'll it, it may take me a day or two because i don't i don't have a scanner i have to go drive like 30 to 40 minutes away from my house to a place that does scan stuff and they um they they close at like six and then you know i've got my it's 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 a hassle but i i'll get i'll get it scanned i'll get it scanned I, I, you know, I probably have a bunch of stuff I need to get scanned. Anyway, um, let's see. One ounce, one ounce. All right. I don't want to wet my brush just yet. There's stuff I got to look at here. So, hmm, here we go. Grab some frog. He's looking like a sexy beast right now. Where is my... My little uh, micro, mic, Stadler, whatever. I'll say that Micron looking ink pen, Stadler. <laughs> Got my gel pen handy. All right, let's rock. Okay, just a reminder as I kind of trail off here and getting on professional. Uh, the question of the day. Question of the day is what are some of your special comics from your childhood you know when i say special comics i mean you know something that tickled your fancy something that was memorable something that that just got you excited about comics something that you just just thought was cool it could be more than one thing could just be one thing and why you know if you have a chance to to mention that um and a little bit later in the show i will answer this question okay but that's the question of the day Do, 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 do. 
Okay, I kind of, I have to kind of like, you know, I'm moving my head to the left of the camera to make sure that uh, I'm not messing up. I got, I got everything kind of set up really awkward here. I wonder if I can tilt this just a little bit. There we go. Don't want to mess up. And getting really self-conscious here. I need to knock it off. I came prepared tonight to bring my A game, and instead, all I'm doing is is bringing everything but. Uh, uh, uh. I was watching a little bit before I decided to do an episode of uh, Sketching Past Men. I, I was watching on Midnight Pulp. If you got a, a Roku player, it's like a streaming device. If you got one of those bad boys, you can get an app on it. It plays you know, free movies, TV shows, or whatever called uh, Midnight Pulp. And it's got a lot of eclectic, um, odd, eccentric, wonderful collection of um, horror and sci-fi and anime type stuff. It's really it's really cool. I, I like it. Let's see. I guess I'll add a little thing here and then. I don't know. I think I'm gumming it up a little bit. You know, I could zoom in so you can actually see what I'm drawing. How about that? <laughs> How you like me now? Uh, but anyway, so I was watching Midnight Pulp on the Roku. And... There's a, a show I hadn't seen in forever, uh, a movie. Now it's called Memories. It's a, it's a uh, anime. It's an anime called Memories, and it was made, created by the same guy that did Akira. You know, and there's a bunch of different artists and directors and and um, you know talented people that worked on it. But the guy who put it together was the Akira guy. Let me say it that way. Anyway, I remember buying that. DVD at Big Lots back in the day. And Big Lots used to be, and then sometimes they still are, is a wonderful place to get oddball stuff that the rest of the world don't value for one reason or another. <laughs> I, you know, I almost got the complete collection of um, Ozzy Osbourne's uh, Black Sabbath, you know, uh, when I say that, you know, I mean like, you know, there was Dio that was in Black Sabbath. Uh, and then there was that guy who was in Deep Purple who was in Black Sabbath for a stint, you know, and uh, I think it might have been Ian something or other. I can't remember Ian's name. Uh, but anyway, um, the Ozzy years. I, I got a lot of my Black Sabbath albums from uh, Big Lots. Um and during that time, like 10, 15 years ago, or however long it was, you know, if you wanted to get Black Sabbath albums, you had to order them or, or you had to find a record store in some city somewhere. And they want to charge you, you know, like 20, 30 bucks, you know, just for one CD, you know, to get your fix. <laughs> yeah. But I managed to, you know, pay like anywhere from 5 to $8 uh, at Big Lots. For each one of these CDs, you know, I got like uh, Black Sabbath, um, Paranoid album, uh, I think the first album. I got uh, Sabotage, got that album. I also got, uh, uh, what, uh, Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath, I got that album. <clears throat> My video quality is a little off, don't like that. You can still tell, I guess. Let me hit this button here, see if that changes anything. Yeah, there we go. That's better, guys. You are welcome. <laughs> oh, it's doing it. Getting bright, getting light thing. Anyway, um, yeah. I also got uh, Ziggy Stardust and the, the Spiders from Mars. Great album. Uh, one of the best albums, in my opinion, by David Bowie. Uh, I got uh, freaking the very first, uh, for PC, the very first Fallout game. And I remember reading the view, reviews on it. It looked interesting. And that was such a fun game, you know. And I, and I became a fan of it. 
Uh, but anyway, that's not the point. The point is, I was talking about Midnight Pulp, uh, a app on Roku, and I had um, I was watching a show that I hadn't seen forever called Memories, and I had bought that DVD many, 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 many years ago um, at Big Lots, and it was a it was a treasure. It really was. It's, it's really great. You know, I don't want you to think it's like mind blowingly awesome, and you watch it like Ah, CB, you're full of crap. Never, never going to listen to your recommendations again. But it is, it, it was, and is, it is good. And you know, uh, if for some um, miracle chance, just for some oddball chance, uh, Stephen, Stephen, if you're watching this, I want my DVD back. <laughs> it's it's been over ten years. Bring me that DVD back. I'm pretty sure you're not watching it. You're not watching that. Come on. I know you're not. You need to, you need to give it back to me so they can sit in a corner and get and, and get cobwebs. <laughs> go from one house uh, and having cobwebs on it and go to another with cobwebs on it. But anyway, um Memories is a really good uh, show put together by the guy that, who created Akira and all this other stuff. Yada, yada, yada. Um, the first story in it is really interesting. I don't really want to spoil it for you. I recommend that maybe see if you can find it for free on YouTube. You know, it might be on there. Or uh, or you can look and watch it for free on the Roku player uh, Midnight Pulp app. Um, you know, trust me. You know, it's 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 some good stuff. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Now, the only bad thing is uh, the the version that I had on DVD, I think, uh, was in English. Uh, this one is is you know in Japanese with English subtitles, um, and I don't mind reading subtitles because after a while I forget that I'm reading subtitles, and it's almost like um, I don't know, I, like I understand it, but not. I guess I don't know. It's it's like if you read comics. It's just, it's a habit. It's a habit. <clears throat> okay. Let me uh, get back to uh, answering some comments here. Let's see. Uh, Abe writes, uh, CB, your list on Wildcat was fine. A little blurry, but reasonable. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I, I wasn't for sure. I, I, was, I was afraid that... I know that first page was, was a little bit more blurrier than the other ones. Um, as far as, like, my question of the day, my question of the day, which was, uh, you know, favorite childhood comics and stuff like that. Abe writes, Infinity Gauntlet and the... And the death of Superman, uh, the, the Infinity Gauntlet, because of the art and how many characters had a had a part in the fight. There was a bunch of them, and uh, death of Superman because of how they introduced Doomsday and how he became a larger and larger threat as the story progressed. Oh yeah, that all that stuff was really cool. Um, I got into the, I got into the uh, Infinity Gauntlet. Uh, late in the game, you know, I remember it was like, it was like one of those books, like you could just, um, seem like you could just get them anywhere by the time it might, it might've been like three years, two or three years after the event was over, you know, and it seemed like you could get those comics everywhere where, where I lived at, you know, and, um, uh, I, I guess the point I was trying to make is, is I didn't appreciate the, the value and the, in the, uh, importance of it at the time. And, um, seemed like, you know, I had a uh, Ron Lim art and I, I really like Ron Lim as an artist. He's just, he's just really good. He's really good at what he does. You don't really, I don't, I don't think he get, really gets credit for it like he should. <clears throat> but, um, anyway, uh, that, that, that was pretty cool. It's a pretty cool series. And then he was talking about death of Superman and, and I have some fun memories of that. You know, it's funny because, you know, sometimes the old comics from our childhood and teenage years is, is a lot like songs on the radio or, you know, music in general, whatever, where like I have a friend who, uh, who cannot listen to Rob Zombie's, um, 
Creep Show or something like that. I can't remember what it's called. Living Dead Girl. Living Dead Girl. Because he had a uh, girlfriend who uh, he, had, he had a bad breakup with her and stuff like that. You know, it was, it was, an, it was like an, an intense love. And that song became tainted somehow, you know, by association because they listened to it together or whatever, for whatever reason. And so that song became tainted so he can't really enjoy it. You know, not that that's like one of Rob Zombie's top songs in his catalog, but there's other songs like it too that became tainted, you know, for him, you know. And, um, and it's like comics have that same, same thing can happen in comics. Uh, things can be tainted and also good memories can be attached to comics, you know, stuff that's going on in your life at the time. You know, I remember when Age of Apocalypse was coming out, um, and I got like the first issues of, uh, um, like, uh, I think it was the Astonishing X-Men and, um, and maybe like this rare, uh, book. I don't know if it was rare, but it's like a behind the scenes book that, that talked about what was happening in the age of apocalypse, you know, before everything came out and it showed you concept sketches and how different everything was going to be. And, and, uh, I'd picked this stuff up, uh, right before I was going to a, a birthday party at, at McDonald's. And, uh, this is when I was in elementary school school and I was at the birthday party of, uh, my elementary school crush, you know, I was Doug funny and she was, uh, Patty mayonnaise. <laughs> so anyway, it's, it's funny, you know, like, uh, so many memories I can associate, you know, through my childhood and teenage years. But now as I get older, you know, I don't have as many of those memories attached to comics like I used to. Um, I guess, I guess there's stuff about life that just kind of sucks the fun out of things. You know what I mean? Not to get depressing, not to, you know, yeah. <laughs> but that's how I kind of feel. But those old books, gosh, they hold such a special charm, don't they? Uh, but anyway, we was talking about the death of Superman. And I'm sorry that everything's like super bright. That's just, you know, the camera is being very temperamental. I hate it when it does that. It's so frustrating. Um, I wonder if there's something that I could just say it where I can just, uh, flash is off, flash is on. God, look at that. Maybe I just leave it like that. What do you guys think about that? <laughs> what dog? I bet that'll eat the battery up. We'll see. I'll turn it off if it gets too wild. It's 65%. I'm liking this. This is, this is pretty cool. Uh, um, anyway, we was talking about the death of Superman and death of Superman was really cool. You know, image comics had in, impacted the whole comic book industry in a big way. And, you know, Marvel and DC had to, you know, make things more sexier, make things more extreme, uh, pun intended and, um, and, and do things that they would never dream about doing, you know? So they can get back that uh, market share and stuff like that that they once enjoyed. And, you know, uh, they had to break Batman's back that nightfall. That was that was a great storyline. The whole Azriel thing was awesome. The death of Superman was great. And then the reign of Superman. The reign of Superman was oh fantastic because you got all these new Superman. And there was a, there was a mystery of who's the real Superman. And also... Uh, who's going to be the new Superman because you had the man of steel, which is, I have no idea why they're not doing anything with that character. That is such a waste. Uh, maybe it's because Shaq O'Neal ruined it <laughs> when they did the movie with him. But, um, that is such a terrible, terrible waste of a character really. Um, and that, and when, when they got rid of the S on his chest, I think that was a mistake as well. It's very iconic. Uh, but they had the Man of Steel. They had Superboy, you know, and he's very edgy and had that leather jacket and the glasses, you know. And there's, you know, he had this 90s whatever look. I thought it was really cool. Um, then you had Cyborg Superman. That was edgy as hell. It was awesome, you know. Uh, that, that just screams, you know, Rob Liefeld, draw this. 
<laughs> that's awesome. Then you had, um, what is it? Vindicator, Eradicator. I think it was Eradicator. And, and he was just, uh, of that bunch, you know, he was the, he was the Superman that didn't really get much airtime. He didn't get really much play in the comics and, uh, he just shoot power blast and stuff. And then there was the last Superman that kind of came in, uh, the, the Superman who, uh, I don't think he could fly or he had trouble flying. He had an all black outfit and a silver emblem on his chest. And that, that turned out to be the real, real deal, uh, Superman. And that was, that was fantastic. That was, that's some good comics, good memories with that, you know. <clears throat> I'm liking your choices, Abe. Some good choices there. Let's see. Um, Abe also writes, when I was talking about the memories uh, show that I recommend that you watch, that anime, the name of that uh, guy is uh, Kats Katsuhiro Otomo. Katsuhiro Otomo. I, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Uh, Jeremy writes, hello. Hello, good sir. Uh, Abe writes, uh, Big Lots is a great... It's, it's great sometimes. Uh, the one near me looks uh, like it's going down. Too many empty shelves. Well, that's a shame. You can find some awesome stuff in there. It's 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 like a tr treasure trove, you know. Uh, for whatever reason, it seems like Big Lots is just turning into a furniture store. <laughs> Lots of furniture. Half of their stores become furniture, you know. And um, I hope they don't go bonkers one day and turn the whole thing into a furniture store because I think part of the appeal is they have a little bit of everything and, and furniture is just something that, you know, may give them the edge in the market. I don't know. All right. Gib writes uh, for his picks uh, about comics is Lobo and Lobo's Back. It was out of control and violent. Even though the book was about him, he was not he was not the hero. Plus, I was around 14 when I read them. They, they changed me. <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love how you put that. They changed me. It's irrecoverable. Uh, can't pronounce nothing tonight. Damage was done. It's irreversible. Could have gotten some money out of that. Uh, the mighty uh, Peter Palamoni is here with us. He says, hello, everyone. Was about to crash, but well, I'm glad that you're here. I appreciate you tuning in, good sir. Do, 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 do. And uh, I was mentioning earlier, I don't know if everybody knows, for anyone that's uh, just now tuning in, we have the uh, question of the day, which is, uh, what are some of your special, what, what's, some, what's some comics that are special to you from your childhood? Let me just say it that way. <laughs> You know, and why? And why? Why are these comics special? We talked about the death of Superman, the reign of Superman, the Infinity Gauntlet, uh, Lobo and Lobo's back. And um, I, I never I never really got the chance to really enjoy Lobo um, in his peak, you know, um, the anti-hero in the 90s. Uh, I, I got, a, I got to enjoy quite a few comics, but that wasn't one of them. I was aware of Lobo, you know, there was a great issue, uh, for example, of Superman after the reign of Superman was over and, and Superman had a mullet and I liked that version of Superman. I thought it looked pretty cool. Uh, mullet Superman and basically Lobo fights mullet Superman. It was great. And, and there's this artist, uh, <sighs> I don't know what is his name. It's not uh, Phil, uh, Bro, Bo, Bogdanov. Bo, B O D Bogdanov. Bo, Bo, he was a fantastic Superman artist, you know, and and really, he he's got this kind of a Del Keon flair, but not, you know. I can I don't know how to ex explain it. He drew Superman for a while. He was the artist on Steel. Um. It's fantastic. 
Uh, but anyway, that he's the guy that did the Superman issue where Superman fought Lobo, and that was really really cool. Let's see, I, I apologize that this light keeps going in and out, in and out. It's very annoying. Let me see how the battery's holding up. Sixty-two percent. Yeah, it's eating it up. I may have to cut that light off. All right. I guess since everybody's telling me that their their innermost secrets of the their childhood comics that they really like, I think I think I need to spill the beans. Okay. I guess I have a couple more than a couple bunch. I think we all do. Honestly, it's it's hard to pick just one. You know. Uh, but one of the top ones right off the bat is an issue of Transformers. Uh, you know, the first series published by Marvel. Uh, and I don't know what it, this is in the early going of the series, anywhere from like issue eight all the way up to, I don't know, 20. It's somewhere in there. I'm not for sure, but you, you can, you can look the cover up and on the cover, I think it has, um, it's not, uh, what, what do you, what, what do you call that Autobot who, who, who was red and yellow and he turns into a, um, a boombox. I can't think of his name. He turns into a boombox. Well, anyway, whatever his name is, the boombox playing Autobot, he's on the planet Cybertron, and on the cover, he's getting ready to fall into a vat of like lava, hot molten metal, you know, and it's very iconic looking. Whoever the artist was did a fantastic job. It, it looked really cool. And the story is phenomenal. And I wish that somebody who was really talented and who could stick to the source material and, and not, not rely too heavy on modern uh, animation, you know, like very computer-like animation because it I've never really been a big fan of it, you know, as far as some of the cartoons that's come out. Now, some cartoons look good with it, but most of them don't, in my opinion. Um. But I would love them to turn that into, you know, like a mini series or something. Because basically, uh, there's a civil war going on on Cybertron. And there is a Decepticon who's risen through the ranks. And he's just, he, oh man, he doesn't, he, he's like a Darth Vader looking Decepticon, you know. He doesn't even have a mouth or a mouth guard. <laughs> and he just tears apart Autobots. And, and, he, and basically, there's like a holocaust going on with Autobots. And they're all underground and secret bases and stuff. And then eventually there's this one that gets turned into who, who turns into a wheel and he gets discovered. And, um, that Autobot who turns into a, uh, freaking, uh, stereo, he goes to save him. Um, but he doesn't make it. And then, uh, he ends up dying in the lava, but he throws at the last second, this, this uh, microfilm or whatever this this chip to uh, to the to the red and yellow Autobot, so you know they can have the information to save the day. Blaster, thank you, thank you, Abe. It's Blaster. It's an awesome story, very awesome, what, what, very well drawn and everything. <clears throat> And uh, I recommend you look it up, you know, that there's, there's, there's places where you can read comics for free online or comicsology or whatever, you know? And, uh, so check that out. You know, I recommend it. And, um, that was one of my first comics that I ever got. It's on telling what my main first comic was, you know, um, I got an issue of Conan with the cover ripped off and, you know, that I ripped off. And in it, you know, uh, Conan fights this villain who, who eats bugs. It's really awesome. Uh, Val Sexman, Sex, Sexman's, whatever his name is, you know, art. Um, also, uh, you know, I like the, uh, Age of Apocalypse storyline for the X-Men. Uh, I like the, uh, doomsday stuff which which i like the reign of superman stuff better um i like um uh, the nightfall stuff you know and 
and the stuff that happened before Nightfall, you know, where um, Batman's fighting Bane and stuff. And I, I, oh, it's just all golden. You know, I like all the image books that were coming out at the time at image. Um, they were doing, you know, great stuff. Now, some of those, stu- uh, some of those books or quite a few of them, the writing was kind of, eh, and just went there, but it's still fun. Still fun. Um, do, 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 do. What else? I feel like there's some more stuff I can mention as far as like childhood comics that that uh, really tickled my fancy. You know, Wolverine. Wolverine was a big one. It's just uh, such a well done book. Um, you know, the X Men titles and all this stuff. I can't name everything off in the world, you know, because then I just go bonkers. <laughs> go bonkers with it. Well, I kind of go- gooed that up, and I, I'm committed to it now. I got wide out. I can fix it, I think. Ah, whatever. We'll see. It don't look too horrible. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, what we got? Uh, Peter Palamani... Um, well, that, that light's bright to see where my battery's holding up. 59%. So I'm going to turn that battery off. The flash off. I'm sorry. Um, hmm. Hmm. All right. Peter P- Palamoni answered my question when I asked uh, that Superman artist and who also done the steel. It was, uh, if I can get this chat to be steel, uh, John Bog. Danov, John Bogan, Boganov, Bogan, Bogan, you know who. <laughs> Let me get rid of this question of the day. This thing's been up there forever. I'm sorry, guys. I get carried away and I don't pay attention to what I'm doing sometimes. All right. Uh, Peter also writes uh, his favorite childhood comics uh, is to, 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 to uh, Nexus, ElfQuest, uh, Heavy Metal. So many books and many creators. You know, I've never read uh, Nexus or ElfQuest, and that's something that I really should put on my to-do list. <clears throat> uh, Peter Pal- Palamani also writes, uh, lots of great image comics. Uh, the art, yeah, <laughs> indeed. I got to ink some uh, Wolverine back in the 90s, just ninety, 90, uh, just random pages. It, you notice how speechless I got when you said that? I just, ah, <laughs> I got excited there. That's awesome. I like that. That's really cool. That's really, really cool. Uh, Abrad's uh, nice, Peter. Did you ink of any John Bogdanov's work? Okay. So let me get back to inking here. You know, butchering this. I'm going to butcher it. Man, I am I am butchering it a little bit. I shouldn't be using this brush on some of the some of this face details, but I'm just I just really enjoy using a brush. It gives everything a very organic look, you know, very organic feel, you know. Kind of kind of gives a that that kind of ink feel of uh Bob um Whatever hell Bob's name is, not Bob Hall. It's uh, he used to ink like uh, ink, maybe even draw um, Iron Man uh, way back in the day, and he also done um, done some inks on Hulk, all kinds of different stuff, you know. Hmm. I'm sorry, I'm getting quiet. It's like when I start getting focused because I kind of goobed up on some of the inks here. And um, when that happens, like, there's a part of my brain that kicks in, that that, that hunter part. 
and it applies those, you know, animalistic, you know, survival skills to art, <laughs> you know, everything else becomes secondary all of a sudden, you know, like, I gotta, I gotta get a handle on this. I can't let this, you know, run away from, from me. You know, sometimes when you're inking, and I'm not, I'm not a professional at it, but this is just my two cents. Sometimes I feel like when I ink stuff, and I use ink that, that seems like it's a little too dark or it's not meshing well, then I basically have to, have to let, like just let the whole piece get overtaken by it, you know, so that way it evens out and it looks like I meant to do that all along. Or at least in theory, that's the idea. Da -da -da -da. I got I got stupid Alvin and Chipmunks theme song, you know, the new animated series, I guess. I don't know how new it is, you know. It's new to me. Da 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 na na da na 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 da da na 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 We're the Chipmunks. Something, something, and Theodore. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty cool. Sometimes when you have mistakes, it makes things better, you know. I feel like it's making it better, I don't know. It's adding a little bit more uh, character depth. Not Johnny depth. No, not that type of depth. Uh, just regular depth. Dealt. Uh. Um, interesting comment from uh, uh, Peter Palamani is uh, no, I think he's only done some DC work. Uh, I mostly only got to ink Jim Califor Califiori Califiori at DC. And the reason I say that's an interesting comment, other than the history of it, which is also, uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, cool, is that I remember I first became acquainted, acquainted not personally. Uh, I'm talking about as a fan uh, uh, with Jim Califori when when he was doing uh, Iron Man. He was doing Iron Man, and they were trying to. I guess, you know, where, where Iron Man, Tony Stark had become an alcoholic, you know, Marvel was trying to, um, rehab him or something. And then they got this idea where there, there was like this time shift or something. And they made uh, Tony Stark, Iron Man, they made him like the villain in the same way that, uh, how Jordan, uh, Green Lantern, he, he, uh, became infected with parallax or whatever. I'm not for sure. Well, they sort of did the same thing with him and, and basically, the Avengers went back in time and got a young Tony Stark and you know, the old Tony Stark died, uh, but he got, he redeemed himself and the young Tony Stark became the new Iron Man, which I thought was really, really cool. And it was very short lived, you know, cause it was, it was going to be interesting, you know, and some people might be like, you oh, know, that's dumb CV, but like, you know how comics is, everything's, temporary you know char characters come back you know everything can always be reset as long as you don't make the entire line of books uh experimental and go wild with it, it you you can really draw attention and make something you know special for a while a best the, the best example i like to give is when they took uh wolverine's animanium away and it made you miss him having antimediums like you wanted it to come back but like when they finally did give it back, you sort of missed him having bone claws because it made him more vulnerable. It made him, uh, it, it put a new twist on him, a new in, it made things a little interesting, you know. It's just, it's just a, you know, a little interesting thing, writing thing. I don't know. I'm losing my train of thought. I guess where I'm inking these lips, I don't want to mess up. <laughs> Okay, that don't look that don't look half bad. I think it looks pretty cool. <clears throat> but uh, Jim uh, Califiore, he just has such an interesting store uh, style, very very shiny looking style. 
the last I saw him, Will Avenger got me uh, the first issue of like a mini series that he had done for for his own creator owned work, where these superheroes go into the city that was like closed off from the world, and the, and the bridge was separated from from the rest of the world, you know, and so this this city became closed off, and and there was something wrong, and I I can't remember, I haven't read it in forever, but it was actually you know it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's so cool, CB. Can't even remember what it's about. Well, shoot. You know, my brain is a Windows 98. It only has so much storage. You know, something has to get deleted. Something has to go. da 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 da, da. Okay. Don't mess up. Don't mess up. Don't <laughs> do anything wild here. Controlled strokes, folks. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, uh, Peter writes, uh, I meant to do that is the most common quote. Well, that's right. That's right. I, I, I meant to do that. It's a fact when I do it. It's a fact. Uh, Gib writes, Alvin, Simon, and Theodore, we are the chipmunks. Da, na, 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 na. We're the chipmunks. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Uh, Peter Palamoni writes, I'll sweep some of that Iron Man run. Oh, it's so cool. It tickles me. The child, the child in me is coming out. You know, I remember the, there was one, uh, it's, I think it was called age of innocence and it had a, it seemed like a all red cover and maybe like a Iron Man mask on it or something. It's really cool. It is cool. Banana nana. Okay. <laughs> kind of gone wild with inks on that one, but uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think I'm going to splotch it a little bit more. And my thinking is, you know, I'm trying to get like the, like the shadow of the hair dra draping over the face, or at least that's the theory. Kind of give some weight to those dreads. Might be a little bit too much. I don't know. Let's zoom out a little bit. You know, we've been real tight in here for a little while. Let's kind of breathe. Looks a little, little goobed up. Uh, maybe do that. Put that in there. Um, hmm. What else can I do here? I better hold off. Let me sip me some tea. All right, so here's what the uh, rest of the page uh, looks like for those who haven't uh, seen it. So um, we've got uh, Crimson Frog here fighting this uh, bug thing, you know, the Vespas. And, um, and I know you really can't tell right here. I'm not too fond of this hand. You know, maybe I'll change it. Maybe I'll leave it alone. I mean, it'll, it'll work. Let's see. Thumb placement. Uh, the thumb placement's wrong. I need to get rid of me, me. Me go ahead and take care of that because if I don't, I'll forget. You see, Rob Liefeld is my hero for good reason. So... <laughs> he's he's one of he's one of my heroes. 
thumb placement, I think, should be here. Something like that. Or right in here. I don't know. Whatever. So that changes it, you know, the big knuckles and everything. Um, you know, put the, can I do this? And so that's going to be the little doodler. And I want that to stick out a little bit more. I think that's right. No, is that in reverse? Let's see. Hold my hands up so I can look for reference. So the hands are turned this way. Thumbs are pointed out. Well, piss. It was right in the first place. That was dumb. Whatever. So let's just go here. Yeah, that was right. That was right. I shouldn't have questioned myself. I'm going to blame you all. It's your all's fault. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, I think what I was getting ready to mention is uh, th this crude bunch of lines is supposed to be a gun, and um, at the on the, the the problem I ran into, you know, and I didn't include this in the thumbnails, is we got uh, Crimson Frog here, and uh, he's looking uh, totally badass, and he's got this really cool rocking gun that's um, crooked and everything, but we're not going to pay attention to that, and. Well, anyway, it's like, you know, this whole fight scene I got going on, he's not really using a gun. And I was like, well, you know what? I can fix that. That's a really quick fix. So I, I, I put uh, this alien dude here, and he's like, uh, you know, take, you know, here, take it, you know. Uh, and it's like, don't you need it? And he's like, no. <laughs> and, uh, this ain't word for word how the script would go, but it's like, no, I don't need it. You know, like, I want you to have it, you know, because... Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, get to safety, you know, what time I deal with this. And, um, so anyway, there he is. He's going to fight the Vespas, uh, barehanded and, you know, it comes, you know, come at me, bro. And so it's, it's got the, it's got the fangs he's grabbing the fangs and, these two panels I'm not too hot on. Uh, I think I need to. I don't know. I either need to commit to it and just, you know, st stick with how it is or erase these two panels or at least this one. Um, I like the body language overall. I just feel that it's a little confusing, you know, because it looks like it's one panel and it's, it's very, you know, this is supposed to be like a very large Vespas, but this is uh, four panels, one, two, three, four. And in this panel here, I don't know. I don't know, so I'm, I I may have to whatever. <clears throat> and then we get down here, um, and he's talking to the, the alien dude, and the alien dude's like, uh, uh, Cr Crimson Frog, you know, uh, I've heard of you, you know, everyone talks about you. you you're you're the savior of, of of our people, you know. It's like you were you were once a captive, and 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 now you're whatever, you know, and well, here's your gun back and he's like you know this ain't word for word how it goes or anything but this is the gist of it you know it's like hey you know uh, keep the gun uh, stay out of trouble lay low you know blah 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 you need to go <laughs> and then uh, Crimson Frog is uh, just kind of walking off and we got the dead bug right here and uh, you know some of the that um, murder honey whatever it's called beehive thing and then we got the silhouette of the destroyed city and i i've already showed this before but for anyone tuning in uh this is uh page two and i thought i thought it turned out pretty good um the look that i had for the vespas kept changing as i drew it you know panel by panel uh so i lost a little bit of consistent consistency there but it's basically like I wasn't really feeling it, you know. Um, and this isn't to criticize, you know, because to each their own, eye of the beholder, that type of thing. But from my own personal ex perspective, I, f I felt like the way that um, Ethan Ethan Van Skyver does does the Vespas and a lot of stuff, you know. Uh, this is pretty much an EVS uh, reference. Um, that, that he he draws them really cool, but but like. I feel like they could look a little bit more sinister. So if you look, I arched the eyes more. I extended the um, mandibles and stuff, you know. 
So I did a lot of stuff like that, you know, little, little things. It's still the same thing, I guess. Uh, of course, he draws mo uh, more uh, anatomically correct and a lot better looking, you know, because he's probably actually using photos of real hornets and stuff and wasps, <laughs> whereas I'm not. Um, but yeah, I thought it turned out pretty good. Pretty happy with it overall. <clears throat> uh, Peter writes, uh, that piece is looking good. And I like your style. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. And, um, for anyone watching, unless I'm mistaken, uh, Peter is the creator of retro. I think it's called retro. And, uh, do you have a Indiegogo going on for that yet or already? And, uh, Peter Palamani also has a YouTube channel and he tries to help out indie creators all the time and stuff. So for anyone watching or watching later, uh, please check that out. And before I forget, Gil, before you leave, uh, can you please uh, plug your Indiegogo for Doomed Barbarian? Put that in, put that in the chat. Um, and, and let us know how, um, if you if you happen to know offhand how how much uh, Doom Barbarian has raised so far. And now one of the last times I checked, it's got up to maybe four hundred dollars. Uh, do, uh, uh, maybe yeah, might be around around four hundred dollars. I'm sorry, I got I got a little men mentally stunted there. And in, and it's like a fifteen hundred dollar go, I believe. <clears throat> and um, it's very doable. It's very achievable. I just want to remind everybody to give you a taste of what you're going to get and to get excited for it and everything. You can check out Dune Barbarian on Webtoons. Just you know, Google it. Uh, look at look Webtoons up. Type it in the search bar, Dune Barbarian, and uh, man, there, there's like 40 to 60 pages of material that's that's already up and ready for you to read and enjoy. Uh, and it'd be really cool to actually get a copy in your hands of Doom Barbarian. Simply the hottest thing going today until Wildcat is released. <laughs> but it's really cool. I love the concept of Doom Barbarian. It's awesome. It's uh, it, it's it's straight out of the pages of heavy metal. It's it's a, it's it's like an homage to, to a lot of cool stuff. You know, it's got little dashes of Simon Beasley, little, little dashes of Sam Keith and, and Arthur Sudium, you know, or I don't know how to pronounce names. And all these wonderful people. It's fantastic. Uh, so, be sure to check that out. It's on Indiegogo. And on Webtoons. Let's see what else we got here. Uh, but da da, -da, -da. Peter writes, yes, retro, no Indiegogo yet, and that is coming later this year. Okay, all right. I got I got my story somewhat straight. I kind of kind of get mentally lost sometimes because, like I said, you know, my brain runs on a Windows 98, which is actually, you know, pretty good if you think about it. You know, uh, I, I'm, I've become one of these people that hates Windows because it's, it's crashed. It took a lot of... Um, important pictures and photos and stuff that I was working on robbed me of those <laughs> because of an update and they force these updates now and stuff and it's it's just really unfortunate you know because the way that they used to do it is they had a team of people a large team of people that would test these updates beforehand and now what they do is they um they just go ahead and release the updates without testing them first and and they lost a lot of their testers as well. Um, you know they're just doing things differently. I guess when you get so big, you know you you really don't care anymore, which is a mistake because a lot of people, a lot more people than what you think, are are tuned in and and turned on by Linux. You know, Linux isn't uh, necessarily user friendly starting out. There's a little bit of a learning curve. But if you think about it, Mac isn't, you know, necessarily as user friendly. I mean, Windows is the most user friendly thing on earth. It's just not friendly to the users, if that makes sense. But these other things, I guess like Mac and Linux, they are friendly to the users, but they just they don't hold your hand. You know, they expect you to grow up really quick. 
<clears throat> All right. Thank you, Gib. I'm sorry I'm keeping you up uh, longer and later. <laughs> Doom Barbarian. It's uh, The link is in the chat. Check it out. Doom Barbarian on Indiegogo. And also, uh, the mighty, magnificent Gib, creator of Doom Barbarian, has also shared with us a link to Peter Palamani's YouTube channel where you can keep up to date to all the latest progress of retro as well as uh, you know him helping uh, put the spotlight on other indie creators, which is really, really, really cool. I've been thinking about doing that myself. Uh, you know, if you've watched the last episode, I talk about how I'm really, really bad uh, socially awkward. It's... I know it doesn't seem like it right now, but, you know, hell, anybody can, you know, sit and talk to themselves, essentially, you know. But, I don't know, I just, I just do really bad with it, and, and I get, I get nervous about things, and, and what, the few times I have done, you know, live shows with people, I question myself, you know, I'm not thinking, did I go too far with it? Did, did I, did, was a little, was a little too nut, nutty, you know? And then I just have to remind myself to relax. And one of the th things, uh, I've done like an early New Year's resolution. I've never really been one of those guys that's, you know, really big on the New Year's resolution thing. But I started one early. I determined, like, I'm not going to be a straddle pole as much as I can. Because I think people really don't respond well or like straddle poles. I mean, they don't hate straddle poles, but they don't really respond well to them. You know, people want to hear what you think, what you feel, what's your opinions, you know? Um, and so I'm trying to be more open, you know, I just don't want to be insulting to other people and I don't want to hurt people's feelings. And, and I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be a jerk, you know, if that makes sense. Um, but I, I, I have to learn that, that, uh, no matter what I do, I'm, I'm going to offend people. It's just like, I've lost like two or three subscribers within the past couple of days. And you know, every time, you know, I open myself up a little, that usually happens. And then I gain like two or three subscribers, like, uh, a couple weeks later or a month or two later or something like, yeah, it's just this weird thing. I gain three and lose three. But I've also been uh, removing comments from uh, porn bots. <laughs> Man, they love my channel. Them porn bots do. So maybe I got porn bots subscribed to me and I, they're just getting mad at me because I delete their comments. But listen, porn bots, I honestly don't mind your comments because they're, they're not dirty or nasty. You know, they're just like, you know, zero, zero, whatever, something other teen or whatever. But the thing is, I don't want my channel shut down for something stupid that you put in the chat because you're time stamping it with something ridiculous. I, why, why, why the hell am I even talking to a porn bot right now? It's not like it understands. <laughs> it's, it's just ridiculous. Let me drink my tea. Oh, all right. Let's get the old gel pen out. This old uh, handy dandy. I'm going to smear your inks uh, thing. Uh, good night, Gib. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gib writes, uh, just don't be more nutty than me and you're fine. Okay, I'll try not to be. I'll let you be uh, the the edgier one of uh, of us two. You be the more edgier one. I'll be the more, hmm. hmm. I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of like a, a comedy duo. But you have a good night, sir. <clears throat> now, some of you might be saying, well, what is this thing that you're drawing behind um, Crimson Frog? Well, it's supposed to be like smoke. You know, the, this city's in ruins. There's, like, destruction. There's stuff happening all the time, you know. So I'm just trying to make it look apocalyptic and, and interesting. And I just basically want to put smoke behind him and 
And uh, some of you might be saying, CB, that doesn't look like smoke I've ever seen. Well, I think that's the point. See, I'm already acting like a jerk. <laughs> but you know what I mean. That's the point that I'm going for. It doesn't look like smoke that you typically see. I just wanted to do... I'm trying to experiment and find smoke that looks like like something you know looks would be me you know something that nobody else does it's sort of like uh you know when it comes to styles and stuff like that everybody is just a frankenstein of somebody else they're a mix of body parts put together to to create something that that, that is seemingly new you know because the odd combinations is what creates the new thing and um so yeah, that's it's kind of where we're at with it. So you know, like for example, you know, I got kind of a Rob Live Live Fieldish, um, maybe a dash of Mark Silvestri and something else face, and you know, by doing the backgrounds different or drawing other things different, it helps make me different. You know, and I think a lot of people, uh get so focused when it comes to the style that they, they focus on the characters and stuff. They, they focus on, uh, how they're rendered, uh, which is good, but they ignore, you know, but they never put the thought into differentiating their, their backgrounds from the heroes, because that's a good way to have a more distinctive style. In my opinion, I could be wrong about that. <clears throat> Just food, food for thought, food for thought. Uh, Peter writes, uh, subscribers come and go happens to me too. Yeah, I get really sad about it though. I always feel like I've done something wrong. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh man, what, what did I say this time that, that, that made everybody go, you know what? That's it. I'm out. That's, that's the last straw. CB was talking about the fact that um, aliens did not build the pyramids that it was Egyptians and they used Egyptian concrete. It's like, that's too much for me. It's too much for me. I, I know aliens build it. CB's wrong. Don't you challenge my beliefs. <laughs> I'm out. We live in a society where, where, uh, uh it, it, it's not three strikes you're out. It's one strike you're out. You know, there's no tolerance for, uh, anything, you know, Nobody judges by the whole anymore, by the whole of a person. They only judge by one thing. Now, that's a hard way to live. It's a difficult situation. <clears throat> do, 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 do. I'm already losing viewers just talking about it. It's just too much. But that's okay. I'll keep talking. Talking by my lonesome. Maybe people will feel sorry for me and they'll come back. <laughs> Alright, let's see here. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit focused here. Um, I was trying to um, think. I can't really tell what I've drawn here. Oh, okay, I see what I've I see what I've done now. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm kind of up to speed. All right, let's zoom out, get a gander, see how it's looking. I feel like it's coming well, coming together well. It's looking all right. Uh, Peter writes, uh, people subscribe to channels here like listening to the radio. <laughs> yeah. A little skin off my back. Yeah. I, I don't know. You know, there's some people that's like me that will subscribe and, and, and like sometimes... There's people that you're subscribed to and they're no longer doing the things that, that you really enjoyed them doing and they've kind of moved on to something different. 
But nine times out of 10, I, I still say, stay subscribed to that person because, you know, I like their previous content and I never know when they're going to go back to doing something I will like. But I think, I think other people's a little bit different. Other people sort of like, like I'm no longer getting the content I like. And even though it doesn't really affect me whatsoever <laughs> and I don't have to watch the videos, if I don't want to, I'm going to unsubscribe to that channel, you know, so like, I guess I, there's probably people that have a really tight, you know, drill S sergeant run YouTube channels where they, you know, they only got like, uh, 10 things that they're subscribed to, you know, there's probably somebody out there that's like that. And if you are, I don't mean no, nothing personal. It's just interesting to me. It's fascinating. You know, for me, I, I'm subscribed to like, God, like a couple hundred people or groups or whatever, you know, just all over the place. There's no way I could be just subscribed just to like, um, you know, two or three groups, two, two or three individuals, 10 individuals. Mm, 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 mm. All right, let's zoom out. Okay, let me put this up here. Let me uh, let me talk to you in, uh, about something uh, that that I think is uh, interesting here, if I can find it. Well, uh, first of all, here he is, my Crimson uh, Frog um, thumbnails. Um, it's not complete, but, you know, I, I at least got the first roughly nine, what is it, six, seven, eight, nine, nine pages done of that. And uh, I think once I get the first three pages done of Crimson Frog, I'm, I'm going to take a very, very, very short break because I have a couple of things that I need to work on, uh, which is... Um, yeah, I got it wrote down here. And it's one of these things when you, when you actually actively try to go look for it, you can't find it. Oh, here it is. Uh, my to-do list, uh, which is uh, Wildcat Dead Men Walking uh, series. Or, or sto story arc. Let me put it that way. It's a story arc called Dead Men Walking. And that's the main comic of Wildcat. You know, uh, the first issue... Still a little hung up on, on on a new problem, on a new problem, but I'll get that knocked out of the way. I just haven't made time to sit sit and zone out for a couple hours. Sometimes it takes me a couple hours to to reach these breakthroughs, but when I do, they're they're pretty good. And then I got the Wildcat Anthology, which the tentative deadline is January fifteenth, and I've got the um, Biscuits and gravy here. Let's see. I've I've got that uh, thumbnailed out. Pretty happy with how these thumbnails look overall. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm happy how, how it's turning out. And uh, not not to be disparaging. Uh, I don't want no one to despair here. But this is the thumbnails for the actual Wildcat um, comic itself. Uh, the the freaking uh, Dead Man Walking. <laughs> But I got a lot of pages already done for it that, that Shinzo have already seen. Um, let's see. <clears throat> okay. So anyway... Um, i got this horror anthology uh, that I'm working on, and I'll show you what that is here in a second. And then there is uh, Crimson Frog. And so you kind of see the deadlines that I've kind of made for myself to get, get stuff done. Um, here, if you're into curious, is the um, horror uh, anthology thing that I'm working on. Let me move this out of the way. So the anthor uh, horror anthology. This isn't something I'm putting together. This is this is part of Will Avengers uh, anthology, and <clears throat> in it, uh, the story I'm doing is called uh, Blue Belly, and uh, Blue Belly is this uh, mythological creature monster thing that I come up with that lives in the hills. You know, he's he's kind of like a 
you know, his his knuckles drag the ground. He has a, a huge pop belly, swollen, bluish looking, sickly looking. You know, his jaws dislodge, and he eats animals, and he's just he's just a very crude looking beast. But anyway, um, using the uh, lock system, which was taught to me by uh, the the cool one, uh, Foy Storm. Uh, now known as Lucifer Storm. And uh, so uh, he taught me the lock system, which was who is your lead, uh, what's their objective, what's the climax of that story, and the knockout ending. And so usually when I start these things out, I try to write that out so it helps me to get kind of get started. So uh, the lead in this story is the farmer. The objective is to find his daughter because his daughter's missing. The climax of the story is that he finds his daughter being eaten by the blue belly. So the daughter, uh, like his jaws will be dislodged and like her little feet will be kicking out of his mouth. Um, I just drew a line on her. Uh, knockout ending is blue belly runs away, I guess. Well, that's not quite the knockout ending. And so uh, something else that um, Lucifer Storm showed me. And uh, you can also check out his YouTube channel, if you haven't already, uh, is the Dan Harmon's, uh, I, I forgot what's called, Dan Harmon's <laughs> Story Embryo, I guess that's what it is. A character starts out in the zone of comfort, they want something, they enter into an unfamiliar situation, they eventually adapt to it, get what they want, pay a heavy price for it, return to a familiar situation having changed. And so when I study this, I always picture, um, I always picture uh, uh, the really great show uh, Rick and Morty, Rick and Morty, because that's basically almost every single episode of Rick and Morty. With a few exceptions, sometimes they change it up and they do something different. Like um, there was a episode of uh, the Revengers, or not the Revengers, the um, <laughs> I don't know what it's called. It's something like that. This super group that uh that rick was part of uh, it actually didn't follow these beats is a little bit different but it was a great episode anyway um so i write this out so i always start out with the lock system to kind of get the bare bones of stuff and then i build on that by using um dan Harmon's story embryo now i don't always use dan Harmon's story embryo because um there's you know it's it's good to have variations and stuff like that i got like notes on everything uh Sometimes, let's see, I got no, eh, whatever. I I can't find all my notes right now. Let me stick to the story. So then playing off of Dan Harmon's story embryo, number one, zone of comfort. Uh, okay, life on the farm. Uh, sings hymns. So I know it's very vague, but I know what it means. So I'm going to show life on the farm in, in the first one or two pages of this comic. And, and basically this farmer is living on this farm. He's got a wife and, and he's got a, a daughter, like a young daughter. She's like a child. She's chasing a chicken around. He's singing hymns as he's, you know, plowing the, the garden. <clears throat> and then, uh, they want something. So I have to set up him wanting something. So to do that, I got to make the daughter go missing. You know, like he just notices that she's not playing with the chicken no more. And the mom does too. And so he needs to find her. And then so forth and so on. So that's how I kind of kind of lay it out. And so number three, enter into unfamiliar situation. So this one's a bit tricky. He goes into the woods with a witch lady. So what, I, what, I, what I'm wanting to try to do, and, and I may have to fix this a little bit and take stuff out, but Basically, uh, a witch lady and a posse of, of people and, and the farmer, they go into the woods, look for the girl. And see, the, the blue belly thing has been a problem that they've been dealing with all summer. And uh, and other people's experienced this. And so, you know, they're trying to knock it in the head by using the witch lady. And so this is unfamiliar territory for him. So at least that's, that's what I feel. Uh, he adapts to it. That's number four. So over here. Uh, I'm going to have the witch lady uh, getting killed. And that the witch lady had like a talisman, talisman, I can't pronounce nothing, amulet, whatever. And uh, it, it does something. And so the farmer picks it up and then he, he tries to fight Bluebelly with it, you know. 
uh, by by chanting stuff and everything like that. So he's adapting to the situation, embracing uh, stuff that that he doesn't believe in. Uh, he gets what he wants. Number five, so he gets his daughter back. Uh, number six, he pays a heavy price for it. So number six, his friend, who who who's part of the posse, he's actually uh, a former lover of that guy of the farmer's wife, and that daughter is actually his friend's daughter. You know, but but the daughter doesn't know that or anything like that. You know, but he knows. And so, you know, uh, basically Blue Belly ends up t- uh, tangling with, with, with this friend and, uh, the farmer just grabs his daughter and he leaves his friend behind to die, you know, or whatever. That's what I was thinking anyway. Uh, number seven, um, return to a familiar situation. So I'm going to have the farmer go back home and, and I'm going to ha- reset the story back to the beginning. So, He's plowing the fields. He he might be sitting in the sh- shade, but he's no longer singing hymns. And they leave salt at the front of the door because uh, the monster likes salt. So it's sort of like paying, you know, paying your toll to that to that monster. And then down here, I'm getting more detailed of what the notes. So I'm basically repeating what I did here, but I'm adding more details. Um, so that's that's how I, you know sometimes write, and then other times you know I, I do it differently. Sometimes it's very, uh, you know, bipolar. <laughs> There's going to be somebody that's going to go and pause that. And like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, boy. Okay, so, yeah. Let me put that up. Let me get my paper back out. I had to take a break from drawing. <clears throat> One Wanted to change it up and talk about something different. Okay, get my papers. Where am I at here? All right. Zoom in. Let me work on these honeycombs again. Get tired of it. So let me tell you guys something that I've been thinking about doing. Um, I kind of got on a tangent there and then I, then I went in a totally different direction. I always do that. But eventually, if I think about it, I always end up circling right back to where I started. So I was talking about how I'm socially awkward and I don't mean to be, you know, all this other stuff, even though it doesn't seem like it right now. You know, I just, I just have difficulties. And I talked about this in my previous video and, you know, I've only done like so many uh, broadcasts and stuff with other people. And I always second guess myself after the fact. Um, and, um, you know, like, you know, maybe I said too much or whatever. Maybe I was off putting. I have no idea. Um, cause I never know how people, you know, will take me if that makes sense. Because I always feel like, um, you know, I, I, I feel like I'm a straight shooter. I don't, I don't feel like I wear any mask. You know, I, I kind of say what I think. I'm not afraid to uh, be a little goofy in front of people. Um, but then, you know, some people will take it only like so many ways. I noticed that people that actually, uh, God, this sounds bad, but you know, people that, that work for a living that work really, really hard for their money, you know, working like really grunt jobs and stuff. They always respond well to me, you know, but people that have more highfalutin jobs, <laughs> high, uh, high class, uh, you know, I, I, I think they tend to wear more mask, you know, and, uh, so they don't really understand people being really open, really honest about what, what they think and feel about things. So anyway, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say is I have, I have social problems, if that makes sense. So it gets in a way of me doing, um, interviews with people and stuff. So I'm trying to work on that and I'm going to fix that. I'm going to get better at that. And the other thing is, um, I'm, I want to start interviewing people and I want to start having, uh, people on my show. Now the intro that I have and all these neat little, uh, graphics like, uh, the SPM thing here at the bottom and stuff that'll have to go when I do my interviews and, uh, have guests on and stuff like that. 
because uh, Prism Studio, as far as I know, doesn't really welcome <laughs> other people. <laughs> so I'll have to use that, um, or whatever that thing's called, StreamYard. I have to use StreamYard. So I'll lose all my bells and whistles, but that's okay. It's, it's all right with me. So, you know, maybe uh, anywhere from a couple of weeks, a couple of days, a month or two, who knows? I will do a, um, I'll, I'll have somebody on. I'll, st I'll start, you know, putting people on, you know, trying to promote their projects and just have fun. You know, just have fun, you know, just shooting the breeze and talking about things, talking about life, talking about comics, talking about pop culture, talking about the Loch Ness Monster. And where did he go? All that stuff. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, let's see. Uh, Jan writes, uh, I say you're pretty good keeping the monologue going. Let's see. Well, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. I'll take that compliment, put it in my back pocket, and keep it. <laughs> All right, so got that ugly looking uh, honey honeycomb going on. Now I'm gonna ink this alien's stupid head. <laughs> See, uh, Peter writes, uh, I'm casually talking with people. It's just like talking with a friend because you are. Oh, I appreciate that. I like a kindred soul. Uh, you guys want to hear um, about the time I was training to be a professional wrestler? You want to hear that story? I'm going to assume that that's a yes. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and tell you it. You know, it's not particularly great or grand, but it's it's interesting. You know, interesting things happened. Um. Well, I always, you know, there's a lot of things that I want to be. I want to be a comic artist. I guess I am. I just don't get paid for it. I want to be a writer. I guess I am. I just don't get paid for it. Uh, you know, I want to be, uh, what else do I want to be? I want to, I want to teach martial arts for a living. I'd love to do that. You know, teach hat keto and stuff. Uh, but anyway, there's a lot of stuff I want to do. A lot of things I want to get into, you know. And one of those things is being a professional wrestler, at least back in the day. I'm still, there's still like a, you know, I still get like a little, little lingering of it, you know. And uh, I remember, you know, back in the 90s, you know, everything was hot in the 90s, it seemed like. Everything, professional wrestling, comics, I mean, you name it. You know, the culture was just like, everything just really converged in a really good way. I feel like music was good too, because, you know, you had the grunge <laughs> coming out, and um, you had uh, at least more edgier rock that was on the radio than what, what there used to be. <clears throat> and, um, I don't know, it's just, uh, it's just really... It's a really interesting time, you know, and, and I think it's one of those times where when you're living it, you don't really appreciate the time that you're living in until you look back at it in hindsight, you know, and, um, I don't know, I'm losing my train of thought now. I'll, I'll get the wheels back going. So anyway, I was talking about professional wrestling. So this is back in the nineties getting into the early millennium and um you know my first little foray into professional wrestling you know i was in high school there was a school i was teaching professional wrestling it was up on a hill everything's up on the hill for some reason i don't know why it is but you had to drive a long way up on a hill <laughs> to get to this get to this place where everybody would wrestle and uh you get in there and there's like 20 guys in the ring and the ring 
doesn't sound like the ones on TV. It's like you step on it, it's like, you know, it just rattles and it sounds like it's wanting to fall apart and they're just, you know, beating on each other, you know, it sounds really rough. And there's this old guy in the bleachers, he's watching them. And his name was uh, Jim White. And there was uh, all these girls sitting everywhere. And, and these girls weren't fans. They could care less. Uh, what they were was the girlfriends of the professional wrestlers that were just, you know, sitting in the stands. So I wasn't seeing a show. What I was, I was seeing on practice. Now, the thing was, I had called beforehand, you know, and inquired about this. And, you know, that gym guy's like, well, yeah, come on down. We'll take a look at you. And, you know, so I was a freshman in high school. You know, I wasn't driving yet or anything like that. So my mother, my mummy, uh, drove me to the place. She sat in the car and waited for me. I went in. Well, uh, I went to go talk to Jim. You know, one of the girls pointed out that uh, he's the guy. Now, for those that don't know, and, and I, I wouldn't expect you to know this, uh, Jim White, used to tag for a short time and also wrestled like uh, Jerry Lawler. And he was involved with um, maybe, I don't know, might have been Mid-South and a lot of wrestling promotions like that, you know, maybe championship wrestling, I'm not for sure. And, um, you know, now he was like a manager and a trainer. So he trained all those guys in the ring. <clears throat> so I get there. And all those guys are hopping out of the ring. You know, they see me and, and uh, you know, they don't want to expose. You know, what I love about it is, you know, th th this guy had trained them the old school way. And the old school way is, you know, you don't expose the business. You know, you don't you don't go kayfabe with people outside the business. You know, you, you treat it like it's like it's a real thing. You don't destroy that that fantasy, that 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 illusion, you know. And uh, so they started hopping down the ring. I'm sitting beside uh, Jim White, this old guy. He's, he doesn't have much to say at first, but then I, I get him talking, and and you know he realizes I'm the guy I called, and the, the 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 vibe had totally changed. See, on the phone he sounded really open, but like in person it was different. And uh, he basically told me no. He gave me a soft no. Uh, <laughs> I eventually slinkered out of there, you know. And he gave me his answer, and I don't know. I, I, may, I may I got teary eyed when I got in the car because I was really passionate about it. I, was, I get very passionate about things. I'm, brown, I'm a softy. I'm very soft. And so um, <laughs> I'm getting. I'm channeling my inner ASMR. See me smiling, sketching past midnight live. I'm not gonna wake the babies. <laughs> so that was my first foray into professional wrestling and, and see what it was I think I think Jim White who's dead now he died like a couple years ago or a little bit longer I guess he took one look at me and he's like man if those boys hit him and stuff like that uh, he'll end up crying and he'll go home and cry to mama and stuff and here, here's the other thing and I didn't understand this at the time and this is this is this is the sinister part of the story. Okay, you need to listen to this. Those twenty guys that were in the ring, they were going to beat my ass. Think about that. A lot of guys, when they first start out professional wrestling, what ends up happening is um, they test you when you first get in, and they they make you uh, work out till you puke or and all this other stuff. I mean, different different wrestling organizations, different trainers do do it differently, do, approach it differently. But you you're not going to have a good time when you first try to break into professional wrestling. And so he had those twenty guys in there to beat my ass. That's what was going to happen. They were going to, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say I was going to have black eyes or anything like that, but like they were going to manhandle me. You know, they was going to make it very um, unpleasant. And basically, if I still wanted to do it, if I showed up the next day, then they would have trained me. Um, and so the, it's something that professional wrestling has done for a, for a very long time, and you don't really see that anymore. Uh, most places don't do that anymore because uh, 
partly because of lawsuits, but mostly because everybody's gotten, you know, uh, soft like me. <laughs> and I guess Jim took one look at me. He's like, oh, goodness, this ain't going to work, you know. So uh, that that uh, I, I guess that's how that worked. But that was not the end of my professional wrestling, okay? Uh, once, once the chest hairs started popping out a little bit more on me, okay, got, got a little bit broadier, maybe some, uh, six or seven years later, I don't know when it was, I was working at a radio station and, uh, I would DJ on the weekends and there would be like church groups that would come in and, and, uh, on, on Sunday and, and, and help pay for the station really, uh, that and the ads that they got, but, uh, these church groups would have to pay for airtime. So from like eight in the morning all the way up to, I was there to like three, three, nothing but church stuff, holiness, Baptist, Pentecostal. I'm uh, not for sure why I'll announce. And let me tell you something. I did that for like, hmm, I don't know. It may have been like close to eight years or something every Sunday sitting there and working the controls in the control room. And so, um, you know, I've got like a lifetime's uh, <laughs> worth of churching. <laughs> you know, uh, it's hardcore, man. Uh, but I liked it. It was cool. Uh, I liked uh, most of the church people that came in. They were they were pretty cool. And there was a few, a few exceptions. And... I remember Yule Napier. He was he. Ah, oh, he's awesome. I need to get a recording and share that with you all of, of this song all all around the wagging tracks that he used to do. It's it's fantastic because you know basically he wouldn't he wouldn't like sing it. He would just kind of yell it, but it's it sounded like singing. You know he was he was metal about it. All the wagging tracks around the church are gone. We ain't got neighbors anymore. We all got telephones. We used to sit on hardwood pews, but now we sit on phone. All the wagon tracks around the church are gone. I can actually do it just like him, but but enable for me to do it, I'd have to scream it. And everybody's in bed, so I don't want to do that. Because we are sketching past midnight. <laughs> but it's great. I always enjoy to hear it. And people would request it all the time whenever he would uh, be on the air. So anyway, that's not the point. What the point is, we were talking about, uh, not biscuits and gravy, professional wrestling. So not only did I work Sundays at this radio station and I got a lifetime's worth of churching, like you would not believe, from 8 in the morning till um, 3 in the evening, something like that. Uh, But I also worked uh, through the week at one point, as the secretary. So I was the secretary. People would come in, they'd pay money, I'd take the money, I'd get faxes, I'd run them up to the studio or through the studio slot downstairs. Um, What else did I do? Oh, uh, I'd take phone calls whenever the talk show was on and people would come in, call in, and, uh, you know, sometimes you get people like, uh, yeah, um, listen, I don't want to go on the air. Uh, and c- can you just write this stuff down for me and, and pass it up to them? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I got two cornhole bags for sale. Uh, uh, and I also got uh, uh, two pairs of uh, underwear. They've, they've not been worn. They're clean now. And I've also got, uh, uh, I got a Pomeranian for sale, uh, $500. And, uh, and, and I got a new pair of, uh, sneakers, uh, the high tops converse and, uh, I'll, I'll ask, uh, $10 for those. Okay. Okay. And numbers five, 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 nah, 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 nah. <laughs> And then I get other people that would uh, call in, you know, and, and there's like a, you know, this live show and I'm taking the calls and I'm queuing them up for the people upstairs so they can put them live on the air. And, uh, I get a couple of characters, you know, uh, I'd get, 
there's this one guy. I can't remember. He was he was a little off in the head, which I am too, but he was a little bit more than I was. And what was his deal? It seemed like uh, he always wanted to hear a song. Uh, it was something from Dirty Boy, and I can't remember what it was. I think he's passed on since then. That's sad. I always wanted to hear this Dirty Boy song. and He actually was in the military and stuff too. And um, sometimes I get people that call in, and I couldn't hear a word of what they were saying, or I couldn't understand their accent. Their accent would be very, very thick. And so I would feel bad, you know, so I would kind of cover for them because their accent was so thick. I, I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. Um, my, you know, my hearing is really bad. And uh, so I can't really hear, hear good. I'm awfully sorry about that. Can you can you repeat for me what it was or speak a little slower? You know, so that way I wouldn't make them feel bad. And, and it, you know, maybe they'd have a little sympathy on me and for not getting it right the first time. And so it just worked out good that way. But, you know, fun times, you know, interesting times. And I also did uh, I, I would do the log books uh, every day where I would write down what time ads are supposed to play and I'd hand it up to uh to the guy, to the DJs up top and then they, you know, do their thing. Well anyway, um as I'm working as a secretary, one day this guy comes in. And I recognize this guy because he's friends with uh, Earl, you know, the local DJ. He's like a he's like a legend. He sort of talks like this and um well, you're listening to rock such and such. Uh, you just heard Dirty Boy coming up next here at your rock station. We've got blah, blah, blah. <laughs> he always did this with his ink pen. One time he was smoking and, uh, you know, on the air doing his thing. Just constantly. And uh, anyway, uh, one of Earl's friends, you know, Earl was into wrestling too. One of Earl's friends came in who I knew was uh, a guy who wrestled. And uh, what was his name? What was his freaking name? Not his real name, but his wrestling name. Uh, I'll think of it later. It's one of these things. I See, I didn't come prepared to tell the story, but that guy came in, and he's wanting to drop something off, and, and uh, Earl and the guys are upstairs doing the show. I'm taking phone calls. The phone's not ringing right now. It's dead. Every once in a while, we'd have a dead show where, no, where nobody would call in. Uh, and, um, well, if I can get this bug thing, it's a dead show and, and, uh, Earl and them, they're upstairs. And one of the things, uh, they would pull out PSAs, public service announcements out of the bin. <laughs> and when, whenever you hear people live on the air, pulling out PSAs and stuff like that, they've got no callers calling in. They've got nothing to talk about. See, I like to talk about stuff. I like to talk about oddball things, live stuff, anything. You know, I think it's interesting. I like things to be interesting. Uh, but that's not the way that they like to do the talk show. They basically wanted people just to call in their cornhole bags. <laughs> I heard that every day for years. I got some cornhole bags for sale. Okay. I got uh, some Louis Dizarn, uh handbags. Uh, one slightly used. I'll take fifteen for it, and then uh, twenty for the um, for the newer one. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, and every once in a while there'd be like some guy who would call in. Uh, we had a couple regulars, and they'd never want to get off the air, you know. Well, hey Earl, how's it going? How's your day going, buddy? I hope it's going good. You know, I I just killed a buck the other day and everything. What about that? What about that, Obama? Oh, uh, they think, yeah, yeah, it's 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 bad. You know, uh, it's interesting times for sure. You know, and you know, Earl's playing it safe because you know there's some people that like Obama. You know, don't want to offend them. And then the callers just going all out and stuff like that. <laughs> it's fun. Uh, but anyway, uh, so the show's dead. They're up there pulling out PSAs public service announcements, talking about boil water advisories, uh, talking about what the weather is, 
And I was like, man, you know, why don't you talk about something, what you did this weekend? I think a lot of people would hear, like to hear about that, you know, but I never told them that because I could tell that they wouldn't be open to that because they've been doing it one way for so long, for so many years, that the idea of doing it different would be a little, little alien. And I say that with all due respect, you know, because I'd probably be the same way, you know, it's just human nature. You do things for a certain way for so long, that's just the way you want to keep doing them, you know. And, you know, they had success doing the talk show that way and, and doing the radio station. And they've been doing it for a long time, a lot longer than I was doing radio. And uh, so to each their own. But for me personally, I just think it's more interesting to actually, sorry guys, <laughs> actually talk about uh, stuff that's going on in the world, you know, places you've been, things you've seen, the, the hot topics of the day, you know. So anyway, the wrestling guy comes in. Now I'm a secretary. They're reading PSAs. I see my opportunity. I start to talk to him like, hey, blah, 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 blah. You know, uh, how would somebody, you know, get into wrestling? You know, he's like, oh, you want to be a wrestler? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Well, come up to my house. <laughs> I live at such and such. Here's directions. Here's the phone number. If you get lost, you come find me. So that weekend, you know, when I was invited to go to this guy's house, who I'll think of his name later. Uh, man, I wish I could remember it. It kind of hurts the story. But um, went up to his house. He lived in a trailer off the side by the road. Uh, it's a nice trailer. Uh, and they had, like, this huge garage. I mean, this thing's, like, uh, a little bit bigger than a barn because it's a little bit longer than a barn. And then when you go in it... Um, he had like a wrestling ring set up in the back of it. Uh, he had like uh, bleachers and an announcing booth. And there was this huge guy. I mean, this guy that was in the ring, I'm going to call him Matador, okay? I'm just going to call him Matador. Or No, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm calling him. He was like a, a mixture between a, a bullfighter and a bull. Maybe he's a minotaur, but I'm going to call him a Matador. And he had knee braces on both of his legs from years of abuse of wrestling, you know, not either not doing it correctly or just like, you know, he, he was a big guy. So uh, the wrestling rings uh, do a lot of damage to you. They just do. Um, I don't know if you can smell this or not, but a, but a real professional wrestling ring, you, if you want to know what it is, when you pull up the tarp that's on the ring, it's uh, a lot of the indie ones, they just put random stuff on there. Foam, um, r random soft stuff. And um, when you pull that soft stuff up, which is barely an inch thick, then it's just like um, two by fours. If, if I remember right, it's like multiple rolls of t uh, two by fours, I think. Maybe some plywood on top of that, but like two by fours for sure. And none of this stuff was like really um, bolted down. And so when you would run across it or whatever, the ring would shake and it would rumble and it would crack. And so when you when you when you hit a real res wrestling ring, you feel it. It's it's a little bit painful, and your body has to get used to it. And your body can and does get used to it, you know. Um. So I'm watching the matador hit the ring, and the ring is just screaming in agony. I think the ring is 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 in more pain from the matador running across it uh, than the matador is taking bumps in it. And so the guy who, you know, this guy's house, this guy's garage that I'm in, uh, Jamie Too Cool Stone. That's him. Jamie Too Cool Stone. He's talking to me. He's like, so you want to be a wrestler? Yada, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's get in the ring. See what you got. And so he starts teaching me how to take bumps, you know. So he gets on all fours, and he wants me to flip over him. So I kind of have to tuck my arms a certain way, and then I, I flip over him, you know. And, um, you know, do it again. I do it again. And uh, if you remember in the story that I told you earlier about Jim White, 
This is one of the guys that Jim White trained. Pretty much everybody in the area that I lived at was trained by Jim White or by somebody that Jim White trained. Okay. So Jamie Too Cool Stone. It's like, do it again. And I was doing it good. And then he wanted me to hit the ropes. And he was explaining to me, in professional wrestling, when you hit the ropes, oh, man, I'm missing people. Let's see. Uh, uh, we lost Peter Palamani. We lost him. <laughs> he says, I should get going on. Great stream tonight. So if I already missed you, uh, it was great having you here. Uh and uh, Despain's comic says, all right, it's been fun. Take care, everyone. I was glad you was here uh, in case you're already gone. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I'll answer some of these comments here in a second. So where was I? I was in the middle of um, something or other. So uh, Jamie Too, Too Cool Stone, he's working with me in the ring. The Matador's watching. And now they want me to hit the ropes. Now, I don't know if you know this. There's a certain way that you have to hit the ropes because I can't remember how to do it. Okay. Uh, the, spoiler alert, my wrestling career didn't work out, but it's not probably for a reason that you think. Um, when, I, when you hit the ropes, you always have to turn. It's either left or right. It might be right. I'm not for sure. Or it's left. Every wrestler, they're trained to always go the same direction when when they hit the ropes not only when they hit the ropes but they're also trained that when they get up they also have to get up toward the right uh when they turn around they have to turn right when they ha when they um when they go to do switcheroo or whatever you know all these different things and the reason is it, it keeps the wrestler safe because um if you turn left then you can accidentally get knocked in the head by accident by the other guy, you know, not intending to do that. Uh, so that's the reason they always turn the same way. So you know where that person is always at in the ring. So it's for your safety, their safety. It just works out good for everybody. And I don't know if it's always to the right or if it's always to the left. It's one of those directions. And um, so it's teaching me that, you know, how to turn into the ropes. And then the other thing is when you hit the ropes in a professional wrestling ring, you always... Uh, grab the rope when you lean into it. So you run toward it and then you flip your back into the, into the rope and grab it. And the reason you grab it is sometimes those ropes break and you could fall to the floor. So it helps you catch, catch yourself in case that does happen. <clears throat> uh, the other thing, you know, they was teaching me was uh, hit the corner pockets, hit the uh, ring post. And I was very squeamish about it, you know. I was like, uh, I wasn't for sure how to do it. And he's like, you know, uh, he'd show me how to do it. You you, you run into it and you turn and let your back hit the turnbuckle. And uh, he's like, now you do it. I'm like, okay. He's like, no, 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 no. I'd do it again. And I would do it again and it wouldn't be satisfactory. And he's like, I want you to do it like somebody is going to beat your mother and all this other stuff. And I was like, well, okay. And eventually I got to where I was doing it really good. I'd make the ring shake. I'd hit it. I'd hit it so hard. I'm not saying I was great or anything, but you know, and he's like, do it again. Yes. Yes. Again. <laughs> well, <clears throat> at the, uh, after that, toward the tail end of the training session there, um, he leaned up against the ropes. And uh, he says, uh, okay, are, are you f are you familiar with chops at any at all? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, show me how to chop. And so when I, uh, when I chopped him, oh, yeah, by the way, he wanted me to not wear a T-shirt when I was in the ring, you know, even though we were just training. So he didn't wear a shirt either. So, you know, he... Uh, so neither one of us had our shirts on and stuff. Uh, he's like, I want you to chop me. So he, he grabs the ropes and he's leaning up against them. And, uh, when the first chop I did was wrong, you know, and cause I was hitting him with the edge of my hand and basically that's just bone on flesh. So it's making it painful more than it has to be, you know, and he taught, taught me the correct way to chop. And he's like, now do it, do it again. 
So I chopped him. He barely made a smack. He's like, no, 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 no. Hit me harder. 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 Good. Now do it again. Again. All right, now it's your turn. <laughs> he grabs me by the shoulders. He flips me around. And, uh, you know, I grab the ropes. I think he told me to grab the ropes. He takes his hand. He gets the palm of his hand. He puts it up against his nose. He takes his tongue and puts it at the base of his palm. And he licks it all the way down to the tips of his fingers. And then he lifts his mighty hand into the air. And then he smacks my chest. <sighs> And I feel millions of little neurons firing, little pistons of pain, never-ending pain, stinging, stinging pain, like being stung by a hundred little murder hornets all at once. And then he smacks me again. And then again. And then my chest begins to glow bright red like red kryptonite. And then it was over. <laughs> and um, basically, you know, we talked after that. And then uh, the Matador, uh, it seemed like Jamie Tuchel Stone had to go walk off, do something, whatever. And I was talking to the Matador, that big guy I was telling you about earlier. And he's like, yeah, man, he really likes you and stuff like that. You know, he, he thinks you, you got really got it and stuff. And and then later on, Jamie Two Cool Stone was talking to me, and he's like, uh, oh, "Shoot, got a P ain't here." Thinks you really got it. And and anyway, Jamie Two Cool Stone, he was telling me about, um, you know, we would watch classic tapes of other wrestlers and study them. You know, their their promos and how they moved in the ring, the storytelling, and uh, all this stuff. Uh, Jan writes, uh, got to run. Great story. Love the voices. Thank you, Jan. You have a good day. I'm losing everybody. <laughs> Everybody's leaving me. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so he's telling me all that. So that was, that was my second interaction with professional wrestling. What ended up happening is I, I went back a second day and there was these two boys that wanted to uh, learn. And he's like, you know, uh, so you just want to get started? Like, yeah. So he's like, well, go get your shit and get, and uh, get in the ring. You know? And so they, they did. So uh, me and those boys worked out. And, and then it got to the end of the training session. And he's like, um, okay, now it's time to teach you how to chop. And so he looks at me and winks. Um, now, one of those boys was not chopping right. He was using the edge of his hand and he just kept doing it. It's painful because it's like, you know, you're, you're, it's like you're getting hit by a baseball bat. And so, uh, when Jamie would chop him, when I swear, you know, my chest was bright red when, when Jamie Tuchel stone got done with me on that first day. But on that second day where that boy was chopping wrong, he chopped him so good that there was a red hand a red hand imprint on that boy's chest. So uh, I don't know if he got the message or not or the memo, but he may have learned that day that uh, you learned to chop correctly <laughs> or it's going to hurt a lot worse than what it should. So that was my second uh, thing in foray in the professional wrestling. And what ended up happening with that was they told me that, uh, where I'm breaking, breaking into the business, I would have to take down the ring. I would have to go to wrestling shows to pay my dues. And basically I would set up the ring when the show's over, I would take it down and, uh, you know, there would be a lot of that stuff, you know, and then, and then set it, set up the ring back in that uh, big garage and then take it apart. I mean, a lot of that, you know, which I didn't mind. But here here was the thing. I was a newlywed at the time. I was a newlywed. And uh, I don't think the wife would have liked that. My gut was telling me that would uh, be too much. On top of my um, 
on top of my uh, martial arts training and stuff like that, you know, she wouldn't have been too fun to that. Uh, so I, I gave it up at the time. And then many years later, I got I picked it back up again. I started training with a new guy um, who was also trained by Jim White. And his name is, um, what is his name? I'm trying to think of his wrestling name. I'll think of it here in a little bit. But I, I ended up training with a new guy. And uh, that's a different story. Uh, I could keep talking about it. It's interesting. Got to think of his name first. Hope I ain't boring you guys with that. Seems like everybody's went to bed on me the more I talk about professional wrestling. My my fledgling professional wrestling career. I love it though. I think I would have been really good at it. My uh professional wrestling name at that time would have been um Thundering Brian Viper. Thundering Brian Viper. I guess it's a play off uh, Hot Rod, Roddy Piper, a mixture of the Ultimate Warrior and, and Macho Man Randy Savage, you know. That would be kind of the route that I want to take. I'd want to have the, um, you know, the boots that the Ultimate Warrior, not the, yeah, the Ultimate Warrior had with the tassels and Macho Man had with the tassels. I'd want the tassels. I'd have to have the tassels. And... I guess I wanted kind of like a, a, a Bret Hart uh, kind of a outfit, you know, not with the hearts and crap on it, but, you know, like a, it's it's basically like a full wrestling outfit, you know, because um, at that time I, I didn't want to wear panties to the ring. <laughs> no panties for me. All right, let me zoom out so we can all get a gander at whatever it is that I'm working on here. So uh, <clears throat> for a uh, recap, for anyone that's missed it, here is what the uh, first page of Crimson Frog looks like. Okay. Pretty cool. I don't say so myself. Right. And then we've got the second page, if I can find it. Sorry, everything's just falling apart here. All righty. Going a little fast, I'm sorry. And then, of course, we've got the third page, which you've already, you know, well, everybody's seen all these pages, but in case nobody hasn't, I don't know. <clears throat> but, oh, sorry. I think it's coming together pretty good. Kind of looks like he's got a dagger in his hand instead of a gun or a kitchen lightning. <laughs> I can't do too much inks on this because I haven't even drawn the borders yet, so I have to be really careful, you know. Uh, sometimes I like to get ahead of myself just so for the sake of progress, and also I, I really, 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 really hate rulers. <clears throat> so... Um, Sipping my tea here. Let me uh, read some comments. I may have missed, missed some good stuff here. Um, uh, uh, uh. Let's see. Um, this Comics writes, uh, Just dropping by for a bit before watching Horror Express, your recommendation. And uh, if you happen to watch the replay later... Um, I'd really like to know what you what you thought about it. Is is was it a good recommendation? Now, I just want to say to anyone that's interested in watching the Horror Express because I recommended it, I I don't want you to think it's going to blow your mind, but I feel like it's a solid movie. You just need to sit and relax. You know, if you get bored and there's nothing else that's playing on TV or whatever, or or you can't find nothing good on Netflix or whatever it is that you watch, just just give it a chance. Just sit there and watch it. Get get past the first five to ten minutes, you know, because it's setting up the story. You know, it's it's very it's very you know calm. <laughs> and then it then it starts kicking in the high gear, and it's a little bit of a mystery. It's a little bit of a, th a thinking man's movie. I think it's pretty good. I I, I enjoy it. Um, We'll see. We'll see what Despain has to say about it. He might. He might not like it. Um, 
what else we got here? We got some more. Uh, Have you all seen the train to uh, Busan? Busan. Uh, great zombie movie. It's what uh, Abe Sapien writes, and uh, I have seen it. It is a fantastic movie. It is one of the uh, best zombie movies uh, made to date. Definitely would have to say it is a top 10 zombie movie. Um, they made, let me tell you something, uh, I can't remember what it's called, but they made a prequel. A prequel to train to Busan. And I didn't know this till like uh, a few years ago because uh, I watched, because I had watched this cartoon. It was a uh, anime thing, but it was like, it wasn't done cartoonish where, you know, big eyes and that type of thing. It's more of a straightforward kind of Akira style in terms of seriousness. Uh, there was a cartoon that was a prequel to Train to Busan, and it was called uh, something other station. I, it wasn't Busan Station. It was uh, it was another Korean um, station. I can't remember. Seoul Station, maybe? Seoul Station? I can't remember. It was something like that. And basically, it, 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 it details and, and, and shows the early goings of the outbreak. It doesn't necessarily show the origins, but it showed how it kind of got started overall. And and then you watch it unfold and there's a twist uh, near the end that's really surprising and really cool. And so that is equally as good as Train to Busan. Really enjoyable. Uh, you, you should be able to find it on Ro- Roku if you got one of those Roku players. You know, um, you know, search for it. Search for it online. You, you'll really enjoy it. It's worth watching. And uh, I think it's not in English. I think it's in Korean, but it does have English subtitles. And it actually, you know, uh, plays a lot better with the Koreans speaking in their native tongue anyway because uh, uh, the intensity and the emotion and stuff is just really good, you know. <clears throat> and they're also making a sequel to Train to Busan. Um, it might be already out. I've not seen it, but... I seen one negative review about it that that kind of panned it as a little bit uh, being too much. <laughs> so I don't know. We'll we'll have to wait and see on that one. Um, but it is it's a fantastic movie. And I'll be honest, uh, the older I get, the more softer I get, the more gentle. I did get a little bit teary eyed at the end uh, because I got too much empathy. I think people that are creative people or comic artists, writers. Uh, actors and all this stuff. We, we got way too much empathy. Or at least I do. I don't know. And I put myself in other characters' shoes and then you know, I don't want to spoil the ending to Train Abuse on, but uh, I, I did get a little teary. <laughs> uh, let's see. What else we got? Um, All right. Uh, Despain Comics uh, wrote, uh, like getting jumped in a gang after the members beat the crap out of you you're in. Yeah, I, th- uh, I think he's talking about in reference to uh, my first encounter in professional wrestling. You know, I, 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 <laughs> I avoided a, a very bad experience for me. And to be honest, I don't think I'd been uh, mentally mature enough to handle that. And it's probably for the best because uh, it, it would have broke me and I think maybe, and, and I think that Jim White guy could see it, that it would have broke me, you know, them breaking me in, you know. <laughs> and so that's a good thing. Yeah, it's a good thing. Um, let's see. Everybody's saying bye and see you later. <clears throat> good story, Abe says. Uh, Abe says Brett was and is cool. Yeah, uh, Best there is, best there was, best there ever will be. And let me tell you something else about that, about Bret Hart. I remember when he went to WCW, it was, I thought it was, it was awesome. And and the fact that he was joining the NWO was, was going to be really cool. You know, WCW, which a lot of wrestling companies do this, including WWE, you know, you, you, there's somebody that's got a lot of heat, got, got a lot of momentum behind them, you know? A lot of a lot of cool stuff, and then they go work for the competitor for this other company, and the other company has no clue what to do with them. 
Now, personally, I think Hulk Hogan, this is just my personal theory. I could be wrong. I don't think he wanted Bret Hart to shine. I think that, that, uh, you know, there was already a lot of professional wrestlers at WCW, and there was a pecking order. There was a real pecking order, and Brett wasn't in it yet. I think if Brett had stuck, you know, if he didn't get taken out by Goldberg, you know, by doing a botched move in a ring, um, that, um, you know, had Brett stayed there long enough, eventually Hulk Hogan would have got comfortable with him and wouldn't have seen him as a threat, or maybe he would have continued to see him as a threat. I don't know. But, uh, man, that WCW wrong run was, was man. <laughs> I really liked my favorite moments of WCW with Bret Hart was when he, the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be, went up, went up against the, uh, the 13, 13 time world heavyweight champion, Ric Flair, Woo, Woo Nation, you know, limousine riding. Jet flying, <laughs> son of a gun. I think that was pretty cool. That was a good feud. And then the other cool thing that I saw Bret Hart do was when he, um, what the crap? What, what did he do? He did something. Uh, I mean, just think this right quick. He, um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was when Owen Hart died. Owen Hart died. He had uh, fell from the sky when he was doing his uh, gimmick with the uh, the the blue blazer, I think. And um, to honor him, there was a couple couple of WCW wrestlers, and it was uh, Bret Hart and also uh, Chris Benoit, who would go on many years later to kill his family, which some people believe in the conspiracy theory that um, um, Kevin Sullivan did it. <laughs> Which I don't think he did, but there's just people that make a convincing argument about it. Uh, but anyway, um, Bret Hart and uh, Chris Benoit, they, uh, they wrestled. They had the armbands on, and that was a really, really good match. I thought that was really cool. So that was my two favorite things that Bret Hart did. That I can remember, you know, I don't, I don't remember much else that Bret Hart did, you know, uh, during his tenure at WCW, and that's a shame, you know. They, I feel like they wasted him. They could have done some awesome stuff, and they could have really reinvigorated a lot of, a lot of the WCW stuff because at that point they were starting to lose a little bit of steam, just a little bit, and um, things got desperate, you know, there toward the end where they broke up. NWO into NWO Wolfpack and NWO Black and White and uh, and then Eddie Guerrero started the Latino World Order and there was some cool stuff that came out of that but at the same time like it was just it was too much NWO you know and here they had Bret Hart and they could have done some really cool stuff with him and they wasted him totally wasted him he would have been better staying in uh, WWE, but then if had he done it, we might have, we may have never got to see the the Steve Austin area, the St Steve Austin era, the Stone Cold Steve Austin. Things have to play out how they play out. Sometimes I tell you, another wrestler that that WCW totally botched was the Ultimate Warrior. I mean, he it was huge, and he gave this epic. Uh, speech his first night back and apparently behind the scenes Hulk Hogan was just so so pissed about that uh, he felt like he crossed the line he didn't like the fact that, that, that the Ultimate Warrior had brought up the fact that he beat Hulk Hogan he was the only guy to ever beat Hulk Hogan <laughs> and he, he legit got mad at that and and uh, they ended up burying the Ultimate Warrior sometime later. And the Ultimate Warrior actually wanted to wrestle. You know, he wanted to earn a paycheck. But Ultimate Warrior, uh, the man, always believed that the reason that they, the whole reason that he was invited to come into the company was so that Hulk Hogan could beat the Ultimate Warrior. It was It was something to feed Hulk Hogan's ego, which I think Hulk Hogan's a nice guy. You know, I could be wrong. But, you know, professional wrestling, is, it's a weird world, you know. 
Some people take stuff really seriously. And the Ultimate Warrior, the guy who played the Ultimate Warrior, you know, he always, for him, it was a job. He made money at it. It was a character. Uh, and and he didn't, for the most part, he didn't let it go to his head. It was all business. Sometimes he was in the wrong about how he conducted his business, but at the end of the day, it was, that's just how he viewed it, you know. And a lot of people criticize his wrestling skills, but here we are talking about him some I don't know, uh, 20, 30 years post his uh, wrestling career. And he's dead now. <laughs> you know, so he's done something right. And I felt like WCW, WCW totally wasted him. That was another guy who could have reinvigorated, did some cool stuff. <clears throat> And uh, let, let me let me Hitchens up with this. I thought about doing a video on this because I done put some thought in it. You know, it's easy to criticize people uh, and 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 say, hey, you know, uh, I could do it better. Well, I can. All right, how about that? And you know why? It's because I'm CB Small was greatest of all time. Here's what I would have done. And for those of you that, you know, you could look it up on YouTube, you know, and watch the the debut of the Ultimate Warrior at WCW. I would have let it played out the same way. Same exact stuff, the same exact bits, all that stuff, all the hokey stuff. It's cool. I enjoyed it. It was great. Um, and I let the pay-per-view happen the way it did, where it was kind of botched and, you know, didn't play out the way it should have. You know, that's fine. I let it go go down in history exactly the way it happened. Here's where I would do it different. So Ultimate Warrior ends up losing at the pay-per-view to Hulk Hogan. And uh, basically, I think what I would end up doing is, you know, Ultimate Warrior wants to, you know, seek revenge. He wants to, um, you know, he wants another match at, at Hulk Hogan and stuff like that. And then somehow, one way or another, he ends up... Uh, bumping in the sting and then at this point sting's got the crow character is very untrusting you know he thinks everybody's nwo or whatever i don't know that that type of thing and so he's looking at the ultimate warrior and the warrior's looking at him and so uh there's a stare down and all this other stuff and it wouldn't be that hard to do it doesn't really have to make a lot of sense it just has to you know feel right <laughs> i figure out the details later but basically, I would have the Sting and the Ultimate Warrior have a feud that would distract the Ultimate Warrior from pursuing the World Heavyweight title from um, Hulk Hogan. And uh, I think uh, probably put Ultimate Warrior and, and uh, Sting in some tag matches because they used to be uh, a tag team. Just for a little while, a little, little homage to that. And, um, I don't know. I, uh, I think, I think the ultimate warrior needs, needs to beat, beat some people. So we, we need to give him some, feed him some people the job to during this time when it, when he does his uh, single matches and, and basically, um, have Sting show up after some of these matches and threaten him and stuff like that, you know, uh, saying, you know, you know, come, come get me, you know. And, um, I don't know. I don't know who would win between the Ultimate Warrior and Sting in, in those matches, who, who I want to win. Um, maybe, maybe they could have draws. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, whatever. But at some point, you know, maybe, maybe the, the, the Ultimate Warrior, uh, puts over Bill Goldberg. And then Bill Goldberg goes in strong to uh, beat Hulk Hogan. Maybe maybe that'd be the route to go. <laughs> I don't know. That, that's my train of thought, but I'd like, to, I'd like to have something about Sting versus Ultimate Warrior, distracting the Ultimate Warrior from pursuing Hulk Hogan, and eventually that, that resumes, you know? And, uh, and then, you know, Ultimate Warrior beats Hogan for the title, and then maybe... Uh, Maybe it's uh, Bill Goldberg that beats the Ultimate Warrior, you know. 
And then Hulk Hogan goes to take on Bill Goldberg to get the title back. You know, do it like that. You know, some something like that. I don't know. I think that would be interesting. I mean, there's all kinds of cool stuff. A lot way, well better laid out than what I just mentioned, you know. It's all, you know, anybody can play. What what, what do you call that? Monday night quarterback or Monday morning quarterback? Anybody can do that, you know. Mm-mm. Oh, you can't even see what I'm drawing. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, guys. I think everybody's getting tired. I feel all right. I'm still ready to rock. But I feel like uh, my stories is is exhausting my audience, and the ends are just getting really fatigued. Uh, before I go, I need to work up the energy to to clean my office area. I need to get that up and running again. I need to get um, let me zoom out here. I'm sorry. I need to get um, the computer up and running. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to do that all within like ten minutes, but I'll do what I can. Um. And I'll probably mention this again in another stream, uh, but I bought some books here lately. I got um, Captain America Heroes Reborn trade paperback coming, so I'm looking forward to that. I also bought uh, Heroes Reborn Fantastic Four uh, trade paperback. It's got the first six issues in that one. And and I got um, the Pit trade paperback volume one, because I got volume two. And uh, th th these are going to, yeah... Uh, I love these books. I already have these books in, in single issues, but now that I have the trades, I, I, I can have all that stuff together and I can study, I can learn, I can grow, I can hulk up, I can I can channel uh, I can channel my energy and together, together all of us, uh, you know, uh, Abe, me, Jan, Fway, uh, uh, Sims, oh gosh, I'm leaving all kinds of people out. You know, Frank, Sideburns, we'll be the mega powers, all of us together. We'll be the mega powers, and then we'll just we'll just crush that anthology and everything else that comes in our way. I really want the anthology to be something really cool. I got some cool ideas for it. And I want it; to, <laughs> it'll be over the top. I promise you that. I'm gonna try my best to really kick butt in that like never before. I want I want to make something special, and and I know all of you is gonna help make that possible i want something that we'll all be really proud of and i think we will be i know we will be and so and also just a reminder everybody don't get stressed out about it don't freak out maybe you don't have a story figured out yet that's okay uh it i feel like you know it'll come to you you know it'll, it'll just start writing itself uh just wildcat just needs to fight something if you can't think of anything there's all kinds of stuff that he can fight um or it could be a sad story, or it could be a thinking story, or it could be a comedy, or, you know, it could be whatever you want to make it, you know. Just have fun. That's the main thing that I want everybody to do, to have fun. So if you ever feel yourself stressed out working on the anthology, whoever you may be, uh, just take a moment, just, you know, get your zen on, clear your mind, just relax. Uh, I want everybody to have a good time, work together or not. Whatever you prefer. <laughs> uh, okay, so I got all these cool uh, trade paperbacks coming. I'm really looking forward to them. You know, hopefully I get them. I got them off eBay, so it's like 50 50. You never know. It ain't the same as Amazon. <laughs> um, and uh, let's see, I, f I feel like I got some more parting thoughts. Uh, I was also thinking about getting a neon sign. Uh, for sketching past midnight when I get my office cleaned up, you know, uh, maybe actually show my face every once in a while. Or maybe get a mental junk food sign, you know, because uh, I'm thinking about reviving that series once I get the computer up and running. And so that way I can garner more subscribers. <laughs> and there's also all kinds of cool content I want to put out about various things. Um, and I think last but not least... Uh and that's pretty much it. So I know you're all tired. I can see the bags under your eyes. I know you're getting exhausted. So I think this is this is time to go. This is time to go. So <clears throat> as always, I want to give a quick shout out to my loyal royal because you're all royal in my eyes. My all my loyal, royal, faithful, true crew, 
been with me from the beginning to all the way to my fiery end because I'll go out in a blaze of glory. And for everybody that's hopped on the train since then, I really, really appreciate you. Uh, and, you know, this is C.B. Smallwood reminding you that uh, be the tide that rises all boats, be the change you want to see, and please remember to always draw faster. Carpe diem, my friends, and seize the day.